conversazione di Ken Pinoc con l'Istituto Bruno Leoni a partire dal suo ultimo libro, The Surviving Mind. The first line uh, in the introduction of your book is I am of two minds about democracy, and so is everybody else. Well, can you explain us a little bit why you're of two minds about democracy? And perhaps why democracy is really more than one thing because of uh, its essence as a, as a rule, as a procedure for elected rulers, as opposed to the history of democracy and the richness you know, of democracy in, in, in the real uh, tapestry of historical development of political ideas. In saying I'm of two minds, I'm simply joining the great majority. In fact, uh, as Churchill famously said, it's the worst form of government except for all the rest. Um, the point about democracy is that it saves us from despotism or absolutism or, up to a point, the government by elite projects. Um, its problem is that the majority is not always wise. Indeed, um, the only way in which democracy can work, I think, is because all sorts of um, foolish people cancel each other out. And the result is that something comes through that, roughly speaking, might correspond to the common interest. Um, but that's about as much as you can say. It's better than the rest. But equally, it opens up um, public life to the, um, the majority and to the simplest possibilities of exploiting the wealth of an economy. Well, the main problem over here, it seems to me, the extension of the franchise. And up to a certain point in history, of course, the Marcus at the very beginning was devised for governing a very small polity. The very innovation there, of course, is, is James Madison and the Federalists. But then, even when you extend the dimension of the polity, it's certainly different if you know, the voters are those that are contributing with taxes, for example, to the polity, or if Abe Knotts uh, can join the game. Perhaps it's not so surprisingly that at the end of the century, when, uh, franchise, uh, when the franchise was being enlarged everywhere, uh, you got the enemy of democracy emerging as well, the dictatorship. It was perhaps the fate of Italy among others. And we, we opened up the franchise and what we got was the meaning. It's a complicated subject, um, and it's very hard to um, generalize with confidence about this. Um, I said a little earlier that uh, democracy saved you from an elite project. But what has happened in the last 15, maybe 100 years, is that the educated classes have developed special ideas of their own. I refer to professors and to uh, the artistic professions and to civil servants who are an expanding class, and to politicians. Here you have a class of people who more or less define what is sensible, reasonable, maybe decent in moral affairs. And these people have developed ideas of their own about how society should be governed. And these have become very important as what is often, I think, rightly called an elite project. And the, the rest of the population finds it very hard to argue against these. It's a bit like what the Americans call uh, motherhood um, uh, beliefs. That is, they sound great in idealistic terms. But when you cash them out into actual policies, then they have a different significance. And they become part of this process of redistributing the wealth, taking it from people who make the wealth and giving it to other people. You're talking about the distribution, but of course the, uh, the title of your book says How Democracy Erodes Another Life. And it seems to me uh, 
they could argue that it is very similar to what an economist would call the Calvin Gallup effect of political choices and ever growing political politicization, so to say, of individuals' decision is destroying you know, the, the, the sphere of moral choice for individuals. Can you explain that? How this Calvin Gallup effect works? Well, crowding out refers to what happens when um, there is a flood of money from one area and that means that there's much less money uh, for another. I'm not sure that the eroding of the moral life is quite like that. I think that um, the important point is that um, something like respectable academic and political opinion gets to be uh, the dominant way of understanding what we all ought to be doing. One result of this, I think the central result of this, is that the, the moral life understood as how we ought to behave towards friends and neighbours by being honest and uh, uh, running our own lives with thrift and being courageous when we have opinions that we think are important and so on. These individual virtues are shaded by collective virtues and above all the belief that we should be altruistic and charitable. But that's not really concerned with the people around us. It's a matter of being altruistic in relation to abstract classes of people, to the poor, to the vulnerable, to those who are living unfortunate lives in other societies. Now that's a different and more abstract world. And I think it is a corruption, it's an erosion of the moral life, but it's very hard to finger it as an erosion because it, it takes a pseudo-moral form, a politico-moral form, as I'm inclined to call it. In other words, you see, we are moving from personal commitment and virtue in your own world, um, trying to keep up with some standards you're imposing on yourself, into some sort of uh, sense of political belonging, so to say. I think that's a reasonable way of putting it, yes. It's, it's a political, a kind of political virtue, and it crowds out personal commitment. And my own personal image of this uh, is the set of pop concerts that have been held in order to raise money for uh, starving in the third world, attended by very large numbers of people who can't even uh, manage the commitment even to get married. But nonetheless, they often have children and firm relationships and so on.